when we get to the sixth chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul shifts his focus from what God has done already in the past through the finished work of Jesus Christ to justify us from all sin, to bring us to the present, where we are at now, where do we go from here? In the fifth chapter, the end of the fifth chapter, he has contrasted the effect of Adam's sin and disobedience and the consequences of that disobedience with the obedience of Christ and what the obedience of Christ affected. Where Adam's sin and disobedience not only affected bringing condemnation and eventually death, Christ's obedience brought justification and life eternal. Jesus Christ essentially came and undid all the evil effects of Adam's disobedience. Praise God for that. What an amazing work. So that he could also say at the end of the chapter, for where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now that we know this, he asked this question in so many words. Now that we have received and experienced this grace, what are we going to do with it? How are we, are, are we going to respond to this grace? Are we going to continue sinning so that grace may abound? And of course, his answer is, may it not be. King James translation says, God forbid. And following that statement with these words, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Notice that sin here is in singular. Sin is presented as an idea uh, of, a, of a force, of a, of a lifestyle, living in sin, continuing in sin. And he answers the question, shall we continue? How can we if we died to sin? Paul introduces now a new thought in unfolding the gospel and all that, the death and, and resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplished for us. Here is something that we need to know, he says, or that we should already know, and it concerns our baptism. Know you not as many as were baptized, many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into or unto his death. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of of his resurrection. Paul presents the doctrine of baptism in a way that we do not read about anywhere else in the New Testament and explains it in a way that we don't find anywhere else in Scripture. I don't know if you knew what was taking place when you were baptized into Jesus Christ. I know I didn't. I was baptized at the age of 15 and all I remember was being taken and immersed under the water, brought up in the, in the, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I did not realize that in that moment of baptism that the Holy Spirit was also doing something with me and in me and that was that he was joining me to Jesus Christ that day that I was baptized I became not only identified 
in Christ's death and resurrection through the ordinance of baptism, but I became actually united, joined together with Jesus Christ, as every believer is. And it is a work and operation of the Holy Spirit. It's not something a man can do. 1 Corinthians 12, in his letter to Corinth, Paul says, is by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And this is something that you and I need to know, to recognize, as he says here, know you not. Do we know that when we were baptized, we became united to Jesus, that we were being baptized into his death? And by the way, do you see again the gospel, the elements, the core elements of the gospel in this passage? How the gospel is so foundational to the Christian life? And Paul, in this passage, as so many places and passages of scripture, will come back to the basic foundational truths of the gospel. And that's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. Isn't it wonderful? We couldn't, baptism wouldn't mean anything to us apart from Jesus Christ and what he accomplished, what God accomplished through him on the cross. And what he did when he died, he tells us in the next verse, something that took place knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin do you know that your old man has been put to death with jesus christ and by the way this old man do we understand what he's talking about he's talking about our old nature putting it another way it's our personality, it's our soul, it's who we are, it's the ego. Paul speaks of this very same idea and concept in Galatians 2.20. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the original Greek, in that passage of Galatians 2.20, there is a, the word I comes from the word ego, where we get our word ego. And that is really our biggest problem, isn't it? When it comes to this old life of sin that we used to live. It was all about self, wasn't it? Putting self first before God and before God's will. <clears throat> this is where the real change takes place in the Christian life. This is where the gospel of this God's salvation opens out to even greater things, to know that Jesus died not only to save us from the penalty of sin, which is death, but he came to save us and deliver us from the power of sin as well. And this is what he is showing us in chapter 6, is how the gospel empowers us to live a new life, how it frees us from the old, that we should no longer live unto ourselves in bondage to sin, but to live now for God. You remember when you see there's there's this being saved out of in order that we might be brought into. Saved out of an old life to be brought into a new life. This is why again just to be saved um, from hell and from death and from judgment is not the end goal of the gospel. Salvation is but a means to a new life, a greater end, a life of obedience and following God. He goes on to tell us 
to that not only have was our old man crucified so that the body of sin might be destroyed that we should not henceforth serve sin but in <clears throat> for he that is dead is freed from sin but it goes on to say if we be dead with Christ we believe we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more death hath no more demon over him but in that he died he died unto sin but in that he liveth he liveth unto God do you know who you're living for today this was the reason God put Jesus Christ on the cross as well not simply to bear our judgment so that we wouldn't have to bear it, but that we might also have a new life, a life of freedom and a life of in, that is empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, by the Holy Spirit, in order that we might live a new life unto God. You remember when God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let his people go. Do you remember the reason why he said what he said and why he said it? He told Pharaoh, "Let my people go, so that they may serve me." It wasn't that slavery was the big issue and the slavery was wrong and his people needed to be freed from slavery. No, it was more than that. They were to be freed so that they would be free to serve God from henceforth. And this is what our salvation is all about as well, and the purpose in it, that God would, that we would be free to live a new life for God. We have a whole new reason to live that we never had before. But we need to do something in order to realize this new life of freedom and serving God. Besides of knowing, first of all, our death with Christ and to be raised up in, with him in newness of life, but we're also now, he says, to reckon on it. For he goes on to say in the next verse, Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead and unto sin and alive unto God. It's one thing to be told to know that what took place of my baptism is quite another thing to count it so. By reckoning on it, counting it so, is where we begin to appropriate these truths to our own life. We, this word to reckon is the same word as we find earlier where God's reckoned us, he counted us righteous, he imputed righteousness, very same word. You and I must count it so. We cannot look at things seen. We cannot go by how we feel. Even if we feel tempted to sin, or we feel some of the, the old desires, I can't go by that, that that's the reality of my life. I have to count it as if for it is the truth that it is so because God's word tells me it's so. And as I begin reckoning on that and counting it so, it becomes a reality more and more in, in my life. And then there's one more thing besides reckon. A third thing, he says in the 15th verse, that where he brings in the idea of the law. But first he says this, he says, therefore, after reckoning, he says, therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Do you know that as Christians, sin can still reign in us, have dominion over us, and dictate our actions? But according to God's word, it's only if we let it. It doesn't have to. We don't have to keep sinning. This is what the Apostle Paul is showing us here. But it's up to us to choose to, to make that decision not to let sin rule and control our actions and our thoughts any longer. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God 
as those that are alive from the dead, and your members of instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we're not under law, but under grace? God forbid, know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God, be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine was delivered you. Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I want you to notice in this passage the idea of yielding, Isaiah presenting, presenting yourself. He says we're not to any longer present ourselves, yield ourselves to our old master sin that used to continue to dominate. Uh, that once ruled in our lives. Because if we do, we'll go right back to serving sin. We have a choice. And praise God, we have the freedom to make that choice of who we're going to serve from here on. But there's a key element in this I want you to notice, and that is the, the idea of obedience. To whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. You remember back in the first chapter in his opening words, we talked about Paul's objective in being an apostle and going out and preaching the gospel. The reason he received this, this gift of grace for of apostleship. In the fifth verse, he says, it's for the obedience of faith amongst all nations. That's when we first talked about salvation from sin and from death is not the goal of the gospel. The goal of the gospel is for us, you and I, to become obedient to Christ. It's the idea of becoming followers of Christ, of being disciples of Jesus Christ. That only comes through obedience. This is why he repeats it again at the end of his epistle. The objective of the gospel is for the obedience of faith amongst all nations. Obedience is a key to living a victorious Christian life. We must decide who we're going to obey and thank the God he's given us that ability to obey ability we never had before even when we wanted to obey we found we couldn't because of that old nature still living where that sin lived and ruled and dominated because it was inherent in that nature there was no way we could be obedient as long as sin was inherent in us and that's why the the Lord had to put us to death. It wasn't enough to sanctify the old man. You know, I've heard a lot of Bible teachers and commentators talk about this chapter being a chapter on sanctification, but it's, it's not really. He's still talking about being justified, being freed. In fact, this verse in uh, 7 in this chapter, he that is dead is freed from sin. The word freed there is the same word for justified. This doesn't say he that is freed is sanctified. Stott, John Stott brings out important truth and thought too about this chapter in his commentary that the idea of being dead with Christ, be raised with him, really is regeneration. Regeneration. This is what this chapter is about. Being made a new person in Jesus Christ. And thank God he made that possible through the finished work once again of the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. There's no other way that could, that could happen. It isn't that uh, there's a connection between justification and sanctification because he says in the last closing verses of this chapter that justification issues into the fruits of holiness. It's because we're now free to serve God, we can bring forth fruit unto holiness. That's that idea now of sanctification, of living a sanctified life. And all it's all because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's truly no wonder that Paul made this the subject of his letter. Why he said he's not ashamed. It is indeed the power of God unto salvation to everyone believes. Unto freedom to all those who believe. May God continue to enable you to walk in that freedom that you too may bring forth fruit unto God.